Thank you. This is wonderful. Um, I'm so happy, and my brother's on too, watching. We're we're so happy to uh, be able to share this with you guys. We were so happy to find out about you guys, because when we were selling our home, it was our childhood home, and when we were selling it in Chicago, we realized just the extent to which we had boxes and boxes of fossils, and uh, so. You know, we first asked Charlie Shabika if he had any thoughts, and then he said, call Jack Witchery. And then Jack said, look, you need to call Ascone. So uh, that's been great for us. And we're so happy you guys got a lot of that collection because uh, it's in such a good home. So I'm gonna show you, this is, this is either a trip down memory lane, or this is like a time uh, machine if you didn't know Pit 11 or Maison in those days, especially Pit 11, which changed so much. Um, so it's going to be a, a nice selection of slides, mostly our family, going through Pit 11 and then uh, Maison. And, and then at the end, I'll show you some of the nice fossils that we found over the years. And please pipe in at any point. Um, and and uh, I'm hoping that we can, you know, just all share this as a kind of discussion. So this is my father, Sam, and our little family dog, Cepheus. This is uh, a, a picture from 1969. Now, it's I don't see all of you because I can't see a show of hands, but I, I'm curious how many of you remember Pit 11 when it looked like this. This is the pit 11 with no trees on it or anything and just the mounds. And when you went hiking, you had to be careful because you could fall into that little lake. You know, we would, we would always think the best fossils were down at the water line and you would like lower yourself on knees to get down there and then, um, and then try not to fall in the water. And it would often be 100, 105 because we'd go in the summer. So it was quite an outing. In 1969, I was born in 54, so I would have been 15 on trips at this time. So this is my uh, part of my family. This is my mom in the center, my brother with the knapsack, me and with our family dog, my cousins. And we've just arrived and those are the hills behind us, you know, kind of the perfect hills. And you had to kind of figure out which, which hills you wanted. The younger hills were better than the ones growing with trees. You first had a stop at the steeple house and you had to register, you had to sign in. It was very laissez-faire, but they did want to know you were there. You drove in, you stopped, you filled out a simple form, which wouldn't pass muster today on insurance, but that's all they asked. Then you would start driving in and you had your favorite areas or you had your areas, especially that were young. The only thing they would say to you, yes. Peter, was there a particular area that you guys used to go to? Uh well, the funny thing um, was that like, like Southern, you, right. If you, we always just went whatever looked fresh, whatever hills looked like they were sun bleached without vegetation. But if you went with the few times I went with like, you know, um, aficionado friends that, you know, were like super pit 11 nerds, they had the super special spots. And, and one time I just hadn't been finding any uh, Tully monsters. And, and I wanted a Tully, I wanted a Tully, I wanted a Tully. And I went with these guys who were going there every weekend. And they said, oh yeah, just go over, just go over that hill and you'll see like two little hills. And he said, that's just loaded with Tullys. And I came back with a beautiful Tully about 20 minutes later. So there certainly was secret knowledge of Pit 11. I'm not sure that we had any strategy beyond looking for those mounds that didn't have fresh trees. I too went uh, in 70, I was in fourth grade. We saw, I still have the thing we signed. Wow. Uh, and all I remember, my father took us in six kids and uh, they just said, stay away from the equipment. I think they yeah. said, stay away from the blasting yeah. equipment. It's the only thing right. they said. Yeah, they would say, stay away from where they're, fresh, where they're freshly digging. And this, this gives you a sense of scale. You know, they were pretty tall. The, the mounds were pretty high and um, and you could get lost. I mean, that was the funny thing. You'd, you know, we'd pack a lunch and then we'd all meet back up at the car, but you could just about get lost. Then you'd have to look for the tallest mound and see if you could figure out where the car was. This is a, a friend on the left and, and me on the right. And um, this, uh, 
this picture is from 1972. So, so, you know, it's just like I'm 18 in this picture. And we would come out here, not, you know, only a couple times a summer at, you know, sometimes as a family, sometimes with a friend, this was our friend's Volkswagen. So on this trip, it was just he and I. Should I take it this is before Braidwood Lake? I don't remember a big lake. So, you know, they hadn't plowed any of the hills down yet. Um, are you familiar with Trino Hill? Oh, where, Hill? The, where the, the Braidwood Lake, where the power or the nuclear station was? Yes. Yeah, I believe that was still there. I was there already. Okay. And that's my brother, Paul, hiking up. And you, you know, you would, you could slip on these. You, you had to, it was an exercise, you know, you got some, you got a workout. It was cardio. This is the Peabody Coal Company sign. Are you guys getting a clear slide? You're not seeing the names on the side, right? You have a full view. No, we're, You're getting we can, a full view. Yeah, we yeah. can see at the edge of the car. Good. So yeah, that's the Wilmington Coal, you know, Peabody Coal, Wilmington and, um, same era. These are some of the older hills with uh, are already growing up. And this is 74, 1974, this picture. This car, by the way, is a Volkswagen Type 3. I don't know if any of you know about the Volkswagen Type 3. <laughs> We talked my father into buying that for us, and uh, I don't. I think he regretted it, but we had fun with that car. And looks like you beat it up. We beat it up, and you can't read this sign. I'll show it to you in the next picture. This is our last day at Pit Eleven, and uh, so that was 1974. The next slide will show the sign that my father wrote. This is inimitable in my father's style, so he wrote. Farewell, Pit 11, September 8th, 1974. All things change, not necessarily for the better either. So why was it your last trip? Well, you know, we, we, would, we knew they were gonna, we knew that they were going to start, um, re, you know, start reconstructing. What's the word I want to start uh, the restoring. restoration or restoring, yeah. And so we knew that was coming. And I, and I think they did start that within two or so years. Someone might know the, the date of when, they, when the bulldozers came, but we knew that pit 11 was ending. And, um, and so we had this kind of sense of memorial. So that's what the sign says. In looking at these pictures, I'm surprised that our family dog Seth that he went to so many of the trips to pit 11. But it wasn't our last trip because then the following year, Gene Richardson organized a trip from the Field Museum to Pit 11. And so this is my father, Sam, and then Gene, and then my mom, Mickey, and me. And uh, we're packed up. They had a group in, in, in a rented school bus, and we drove off to Pit 11. And then this is uh, a lovely collection from that day, which is going to make you smile when you see like the plentitude at that time. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Crazy, right? Crazy. So now we're going to leave Pit 11. We're going to go back in time. This is Greer. And my father and mother, you know, and they just sort of discovered the coal pit, um, coal shale, fossil hunting, because they had been fossil hunting all around the US and various, I mean, we went to Beartooth Butte and all these things. Every family vacation was built around fossil hunting. And uh, so, you know, then they discovered that you, we, we could do Maison Creek and they discovered you could do uh, Greer. And this is 1958. So I'm just four years old at this time. Greer, uh, for those of you who don't know Greer, it was just a, a very nearby, it was all part of the Francis Creek Shale uh, underlayer, but they were using this site to simply train people in how to use bulldozers and end loaders. 
So, and they allowed you to come on the site and find concretions, which they had dug up inadvertently, teaching people how to dig deep holes with the Caterpillar machinery. And uh, so you can see by the age of the car, you know, we're talking 1958. But the interesting thing about Greer, and as I say, I don't remember Greer, and we didn't go back there. I never went to Greer. Um, once we discovered Maison, Maison was so much fun, you know, that we, we never went back to Greer. But Greer was famous for large, large plant fossils, really big sizes. And uh, so, you know, it has its, it's interesting how each area had its kinds of concretions and its kinds of flora and fauna. So this is my brother who's six in this picture. He's two years older than me, uh, examining the finds at Greer. Hey, Peter, I had a question um, about opening the concretions. Yes. It, in this photo and, and two prior, when you showed us the bounty of Pit 11, it yes. appeared to me that a lot of them were hammered open. Yes. Did the concept of freeze thawing occur to you or was it even in the discussion or, or did that come much later? Much later, we, we only knew hammers. <laughs> yeah. And we only, and, and you weren't, it wasn't a good day out if somebody didn't bash their thumb. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 and it's true, looking back at them, how many of our fossils, you know, carry that chipped edges and sometimes the damage was there and, you know, freezing and thawing is, is truly better. And every now and then, of course, a fossil would naturally expose itself, uh, having split naturally. And I'm sure that's what gave the idea of the freezing and thawing, because you would find sometimes, but, you know, then they were subject to mud or something covering them. So... If, if they were lying out on the slag heap and they were already exposed because they had naturally split open, you had to be lucky that they weren't covered with a film layer of mud or something to obscure them. But yeah, we cracked them. You know, you would look for your cracking rock and then you would crack them all open. Yeah, it, it seemed to be apparent in like two, two frames ago. Oh, yeah. There seemed to be like a, an anvil and a yeah. hammer and a lot of laid out uh, hammered yes. stones. And it's interesting, you mentioned earlier in the talk that you avoided the older hills, mm -hmm. but when, when that may have been the spot where some of the concretions were naturally opening, yeah. naturally, you know, yeah. seasoned as it were. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, it, it, you could walk an hour and not really have found, at Pit 11, you could walk an hour and not really have found too many wonderful things, a lot of blobs and maybe, you know, not too much. And uh, then you'd hit a hill that for some reason had a, two or three really good things in it. And I don't know what that distribution represents. And, and it's interesting to think about what, I'm not sure what our prejudice was for the sun-baked hills. You know, as kids, it was a Badlands and we just enjoyed hiking it. You really felt like you were out in the Badlands. And so, you know, to be on those, like I said, you could get really get lost and, and you'd find a little lake section and, you know, one of those ponds and then all the stark hills and it would be really hot out. And so it really was like you were you were suddenly transported to the West. You know, you felt like you were in the Badlands. Well, well, you heard that we had a field trip today to the Braceville spoil pile. Yeah. And although it's only one hill versus the magnificence of, you know, getting lost in a sea of them. Yeah. Uh, half the fun is running up and down the hill. You yeah. Know? Totally. Especially totally. for the kids. Yeah. <laughs> and you can imagine our family dog. You know, he had a field day there. I, I would agree with with Peter that yeah it was just it was like the Badlands and you you know uh, it was vast especially yeah. when you were little yeah. and you could get yeah. lost in them and I just think there were so many things around you just hammered them because that's what I saw all the other people that were there they did I mean George Langford hammered all those things if you read his stuff back then when mm -hmm. it was not they were they were everywhere there was enough that who cared. You, and you wanted mm -hmm. something now, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you know, you yeah. just, just had time. Yeah. Had, plus, you couldn't carry enough. There were so many. Yeah. And it was magical as a kid. You know, you would be banging away and this thing would split open. And then, you know, preposterously, there would be this beautiful fern inside. Like, what? How? How is that possible? Right. So it was um, quite magical. And the act of smashing it open was somehow linked to the whole process, you know. Whereas it is a better way to freeze them open, and um, and because it preserves and it and it follows the fault lines better of the, of you know the um, the piece inside. But yeah, there is something magical about smashing away on these things, you know, especially if you're ten years old.
I do remember my thumb was hit so many times the first day it turned black and fell off for three months. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and we always counted on someone hitting their thumb. It was often my father. So uh, you'd hear the cry. And uh, so here, here we go, Maison. So we're, we're going to move on to Maison Creek now. Um, yeah, as you see, my folks were life members of the Maison Creek Project. What happened to Pit? Sorry? 11. Is it still 11? here? Yeah, so now, um, now I've moved on to Maison, our fossil hunting in Maison Creek. But what yeah. happened to Pit 11? Yeah, so here? yeah, so I, I can I can return later if you'd like to see some more of the of those shots of Pit 11. But now these from here, I'm gonna show you from the same covering really the same time period, Maison Creek, because um, my, my father had found a um, newspaper article on Maison Creek and he tried to track it down. This is 1958. And he had tried to track down how you get to the creek and where, where they showed the, the Benson farm, but it wasn't all identified. And so it, it took a lot of sort of strategy at that time. I'm sure there were others that knew other ways of getting access, but. But we, but my father, like really, he just he just created his own route of access by befriending the Bensons and 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 creating this opportunity to go through their property down to the creek. So for us, all of our um, uh, fossil hunting on Maison was done through the Benson farm. So that's me on the right, uh, and the, I see they dressed my brother and I the same. That's mom, and she's paying no attention to me because that was a different era. So you're just trusting I wasn't going to fall in the water, and um, and for us it was this great adventure. Uh, the the shale layer could be slippery, and you had as you guys know, and you had to, you know, you had to watch your footing, and you had to get down there through the poison ivy and whatnot to the water, and the water was pretty shallow. Uh, again, as any of you know who've been through there, the water never gets very deep. Sometimes if there's enough rain, you can bring a, a canoe through. But um, that's my brother pointing out, uh, you know, a, a fossilized layer. Uh, maybe, it, maybe that was a, a long um, uh, stem. Here's my father lowering himself down. We had always tie a rope to a tree and lower ourselves down because the side bank could be quite muddy. I don't know what my father has in that box. I think it's a clear box that I think he was collecting dragonfly nymphs that live in the water so he could feed his coolie loach fish back at our house. And then a nice black and white shot of the shale layer and you can see a concretion there. Sometimes there would be these really big ones in the shale and, and they wouldn't often have anything in them and they'd be a lot of work to bang open with the hammer. And we got to know where the shale was hard, you wouldn't find the good concretions. Where the shale was closer to the water and a little softer is where you would find them. We really kind of learned that whole bank. And I understand now it's, it's not something you guys can really do anymore is the banks because of erosion and the, and the farm property is not anxious to have people landing and digging into the banks. Um, but it, it was... Um, you know that was our little playing, our little stomping ground. So this is uh, this is some of the big concretions that we would pull out of the bank. And these pictures are all again from 1958. So this is quite a long time ago. And then the creek itself, again, from that time, and uh, looking so, you know, exotic. I'm sure it looks the same today, but it's just in this picture, you could imagine that you, you could be in, you know, Guatemala or something. It's just the way the vines, and it's always, always such a beautiful sight. Uh, it's, the, it's a tributary of the Illinois River. Uh, I, I'm imagining everyone's been there, but 
if you haven't, it, it is a really beautiful, it is a really beautiful stream. That almost looks like, a, sorry. That's okay, it almost looks like what? He was getting an echo. That's okay. I was gonna say that almost looks like it was looking downstream. Yeah, so that's interesting. The upstream, I'll go back. The upstream, downstream, you know, the, the patch on the Benson farm, and I have a picture coming up of the Benson. So you, I'll show you the Bensons that, that we actually went through two parts of the family. You know, it started out with one and the other, and I'll, and I'll mention that, it's interesting. But uh, we only knew the stream for that short stretch that was the, on the Benson's property. And it's interesting how well we got to know it. You got to know how far you could go in either direction and then the shale layer would disappear or it wouldn't be productive anymore. The productive part was very close to where we would lower ourselves down. And there was a little bit of a water, you know, just the, 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 the high ground was draining out through and left this whole long patch where the water coming from the farm field had eroded away any vegetation. And that was always one of the best spots. And you would always hit that spot first, you know, you'd race over to that spot and, and pull out all the best ones that had surfaced from the year before. This as upstream or downstream, that's so interesting. I, I know, I'll show you a picture I know is looking downstream. I, I think this is looking upstream because I think this is the far end of where we would get fossils. I think this on the right there is about where the patch of shale ended. You may know, I think I told you is we collect there once a year, but from the other side yeah. of the river, from yeah. the, um, the Kodat farm. And it looks very familiar. It doesn't look that much different. Oh, that's so interesting that it, it yeah, it's not, I suppose it's not surprising that it hasn't changed much. But sure, we occasionally would cross the river to that side, but we never found anything on that side. We never thought of it as, and we would try to find things in the river and you wouldn't find much. And if you went too much further than where they're having lunch, where we're all having lunch, you wouldn't find much. I mean, the sweet spot was narrow on the Benson farm in the days that we were there. And it could have just been that we had gotten so used to it and sort of memorized all its nooks and crannies So this is 1972. Uh, I'm now uh, 18, you know, just starting college, and my brother is 20, and my father and my mother obviously took the picture. So, it, and but we would often go with friends as well. But sometimes it would just be the four of us. And that's a really that was like we're sitting on the choice stretch for us. You know, that's the choice stretch where we did most of our fossil hunting. fishing them out of the river. And that's pretty high water on this trip. That's that same trip from, from 72, 1972. So you guys, are you, you, there's no shale showing there. So you must be, well, you were directly across from the Bensons. It must be lower water because when the water was too high, you wouldn't find shale on the other side. Do you know what time of year that was? You know, we, we would go, here's my brother, um, he, I would have to ask him, but he, he, we would go at different times in the summer. Sometimes it would be, you know, in, in the heat of the summer. Sometimes it would go in the spring. I would, I would imagine this was a spring trip. You know, if, I'd photo, if, I, if it was today, we would take this picture with our, our iPhone and it would timestamp and date stamp it. <laughs> But these are Kodachromes. These are scanned Kodachrome slides. Wow. See, we normally go in the fall, late August. Oh, yeah. No, no. We tend to be much lower then. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. we went in, in the August once, in August once or twice, but we would often go in, you know, in summer and summer school break and all of that. Nice macro neuropterus there in the bucket. Yeah, right? Yeah, right on the top of the pile. Dave, you've been there quite a bit uh, different times of the year too, haven't you? Uh, yes, I've been, except for dead of winter, but, yeah, I suppose. But yeah, probably from March through October, I've been there 
numerous times in the last 20 years since I've been working on Pete's land for the research I did. And then those of us who do the yearly thing for the uh, I&M Canal. And then there's other parts of the river I've been on too, but yes. Yeah. I want to reach out and grab that concretion right there. <laughs> I know this is kind of, it's so yummy, right? It looks so yummy, like I'm going to just take that. And of course, um, uh, you know, the, the Bensons, um, they worried a little bit about, you know, were we hurting the bank? And uh, Russell, who was the other brother who we later were, were um, getting permission from, was first it was Fred and then later Russell. He was more stern. Fred was very hands off. He's just go down there and have fun. R Russell was more like, now please don't dig in the bank. I don't want any digging in the bank. And, you know, I, 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 I get it. And where we dug mostly was just right out, almost at the water level or a couple feet up from the water level. It was gonna, they were gonna come out naturally. So this is Russell and, and Mrs. Benson and has, did anyone in the group ever go to Maison through this route, through the through the Benson farm? I'm curious. Those yeah, of us I've, been, do I've been there through the Bensons too, early on, but. Yeah, and so were they, so did you, did you, you went through between the cornfields and then down to the tree line you see and take the right turn and the whole, and then around to the lower field we started near the house because that's where we met them, and that's about I saw her. Yeah. I mean, okay. it wasn't that long ago. This was still I was an adult, but I, I don't remember exactly. I yeah, yeah. And was it Russell? Was it Russell Benson that you? I think he was still I mean, alive twenty years ago. Yeah. So well, so like I was saying, it started with my father uh, getting to know Fred Benson from the newspaper article identifying the property, and I'm sure it was known at that point. But that's how we got there. And then my father would always be sure he remembered what beer Fred Benson liked. And then we would bring a six pack. And then we would bring a six pack to Russell later when it became Russell's farm, they traded farms. And so uh, Fred went on the other side of the road and Russell was on this side of the road now. So now you went through Russell's and he was also very friendly. And, but, um, but then he didn't drink anymore. So he, he, we would bring him uh, a non-alcoholic uh, six pack. And I don't know the tradition of the six pack, but it was amusing to us as kids. We would sit in the car waiting for my father to go knock on the door with the six pack. And then they would come out and they were super friendly. And then we would go down the, the, the so it was two big fields, two big farm fields. And you took a long, uh, if you had to walk it, it was a long walk. If you could drive it, you couldn't always drive it because where a tractor can go and where a car can go, of course, are two different things. So you could sometimes drive it all the way, most of the time drive it all the way. There was a few times when we had to park and walk it. And then you walked all the way to that tree line you're seeing, and then you took a right turn. And then behind the trees, there was a road in the trees and you went all the way down there and then took another turn down and uh, then you parked. And I have a picture of us having lunch where you parked uh, or you walked all the way in if you had to. So this is 1974 again. So I'm now I'm two years older than in the last set of pictures. And, and this one, so at this point I'm a sophomore in college, and and my uh, and my brother he's just he's getting close to graduating college, and um, and then canoers. And so I'm maybe some of you have come to this site on a canoe. Has anyone canoed into the to the fossil hunting area? I've always thought that would be romantic to like canoe and then park your canoe for lunch and fill up a couple pails of concretions and continue on your way. Always been know, tempted, but because of laws today, we don't generally don't do it. The law would prevent you from the, what would be the infraction? Well, this is non navigable. Okay. So uh, property lines meet up in the middle of the river and 
the ground <laughs> you step on is private property. Any anywhere in this river is private property. Yeah. So oh, you'd have cool. to get the okay of everybody that you want to trespass on before okay. you can really do anything. <laughs> All right, so interesting. So this scene is is truly uh, this is a historic moment. Fossil hunting with canoers. Well, some of us know fossil hunting with canoers, but we were not in the canoes, but that goes back to the era discussion. Those people know yep. who I'm talking about. Yep, yep. And you can see on the ground, you know, our little collection of, uh, of finds for the day. And I think my brother has a hammer. I think he's about to break one open. And we lowered our, we would tie a rope to the tree and lower ourselves down. Cause like I said that this, and this is a well-worn path. So I don't know if it was fossil hunters or, or what, but it's interesting that I look at this picture that that is so well-worn. So this is up on the, you know, where we had lunch. This is, if you could get the car all the way in, this is where we would pull it in and park on the Benson farm. It was their lower field. They had a higher, those higher, those two high fields and then this lower field. So family, friends and, and mom and dad, and again, our dog, Seth. And we would usually, you know, fossil hunt the morning. Well, it took, you know, it's an hour and a half to get there from Chicago. And then, and then we would, hunt for a couple hours and then take a lunch break and hunt a couple more hours and head home. So your mom uses binoculars to find concretions, huh? <laughs> so that, so that's our family friend Mildred Williams with the binoculars. My mom's in the white hat, uh, but Mildred is an avid birder. So she would bird and she would do, do birding while we were fossil hunting. <laughs> and the woodland was really healthy. You know, it had mayapples and trillium and all of it, you know, the, the, it, because it hadn't really been used for anything except the dividing area between the farm fields and so it really was kind of quite a lovely woodland that you went alongside of is that your father it looks like he's about to dive in yeah uh my father was is a very was a very extraordinary person and 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 never one to shy away from uh uh, uh fully immersing himself in any activity <laughs> It's awesome to see these pictures. I guess we're like training our dog to sniff out a good neuropterus. Did the dog ever go into the river? Did it swim? You know, he, he was a he was a wonderful dog. He was a beagle Airedale mix. He wasn't a huge water dog. You know, he loved to chase squirrels. He was very smart, but he wasn't really much of a water dog. I think we took him, put him in the water a few times just to annoy him, and then he would come running out. What a great companion, though, on your on your adventures. You know? I know, right? Yeah, I know. Like and this and this is the last. This is the last. I, I wasn't. I was already away in graduate school. This is the last set of times we went to, to Maison. My father went, this is, this is my cousin, Ellen and Mark. Um, and you know, this is getting towards 1984. And, uh, and I was down in Alabama in graduate art school. And, and uh, uh, but my father still would go out sometimes by himself.
And so this is really, I think this was his last trip. He, he obviously went with mom because she took the picture too. I mean, they would go together, of course, but but sometimes just the two of them would, would go to the creek. And this is what they found on that day. Very nice. All right, so now, <laughs> <laughs> yes, so now Rich and Keith checking, checking through the finds. They were, they, were, they were finding some good stuff in these drawers too, because you know, it, it had been a while since my brother was teaching architectural history and living in, and they live in Urbana, Illinois. And, and I live now in Brooklyn, but I was down in, in Alabama for a long time. And so, uh, uh, you know, we had sort of forgotten how many wonderful things and we hadn't identified them all. And so it was really a joy to have some of this, to have you guys look at this and identify some of them. And so now the, the rest of this, uh, presentation, I have just pictures of some of the nice fossils from the collection. So I'll show you those and anyone pipe up who can positively identify and there's a few that are slightly mysterious. I mean, we all know the Tully monsters. But... So this is just the tip of the iceberg as Rich and Keith will, will testify. We had boxes and boxes and boxes. I didn't realize how much my father had saved it in the basement. This was it in the garage, just maybe half of what we had. So these are two happy after they've loaded the car. Uh, and I was wearing a mask. I just took it off of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, the masks. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we don't even know what's going on out here in Brooklyn. Is there's so much controversy about it, but that's another story. So um, some nice. So here's some nice fossils from the collection. This is a a big um, acanthotelson that you you can see a lovely intestinal tract. If you're if you love to see a lovely intestinal tract on a shrimp, you have to say this is a good one. I think that's actually Kelly Brooksia. Uh, what do you think, Andrew? Um, I'm I'm going to go with the Lobotelson camp, mm. but I'm not sure. It's about it's pretty big. It's about the size. Just, just because the rostrum is so long, you know, mm. on the on the left side. But I I don't know. Not in the camp the Telson, that's for sure. Yeah, I think Lobotelson might be mm. family. Okay, oh. here's the here's the other half. <clears throat> And it's about the size of a bar of soap or a little bigger. It's a fairly big concretion. This one opened without any real damage. You just see a few little chips on the, sometimes you could get away with it with the hammer because they would be so ready to open. Yeah. And you, you didn't have to work nearly as hard on pit 11 concretions. They were so different at, you know, in their, in their makeup, you know, the mineral makeup is, was so different with all that iron in them or whatever that was in the, the pit 11 concretions. And so they would open easier. The Maison concretions were, you know, this is a pit 11 concretion and they were easier to open. The, the Maison concretions, if they weren't gonna split, they weren't gonna split, you know, it's like they were a handful. And it would be interesting to know if the Maison ones, you guys would, someone might know this from experience. Is there much difference in freeze opening pit 11 versus Maison? Yes. Yes, a lot. You got to be a lot gentler with um, the Maison concretions because sometimes they're softer in nature. I know some people who put the small ones in like paper cups mm. and would freeze them and they just kept using paper cups or small. I use small plastic containers to freeze the little ones, but the Maison concretions needed to be checked more often and more frequently so they didn't disintegrate. Mm. The ice could destroy them. Mm. I think a mm -hmm. contributing factor is the water environment too. At least for those of us who've done the canal corridor, most of the concretions that we're finding are in the water. 
and have mm -hmm. been in the water for a long time. So sometimes I'm thinking that we have to let them dry out a little bit before we actually start the freeze thaw process. Mm -hmm. Because it just starts splitting in lots of layers, not just the one you want. Yeah. Interesting. And we and because of those layers, like you mentioned, we tend to go longer, not just after the first split, because you may get a split or two later that has the fossil in it. Mm. Nicely, Scar. And that's pretty, this is a pretty, pretty long concretion, you know, it's bigger than a banana. And it was unusual to find, you know, such a, such a, a significant size. This is the Tully monster that I asked the guys, you know, this is, okay, so you know, I was determined to have a dolly monster, right? And I hadn't found one. I don't know why, because they, then in the end, they weren't so impossibly hard to find. I mean, if you put your mind to it, you could have three or four pretty good ones in your collection. But I hadn't found one yet. And this is the one where the guys said, go over there to Tully Gulch and you'll find one. And it's, it's, an, it's again, this is again about the size of a banana. It's pretty, it's pretty big. So I, I reckon this is like, a full grown Tully. I just read this article on Tully's, right? You, everybody's read it. I don't know the controversy. Maybe it didn't come out that recent, but what is it? And so it was so interesting. There was a, you know, it's a fun one to look up because I think they finally resolved what it is, you know, what, where it fits, what genus, where it fits in the, what kind of animal was it? Paul, who's on this uh, meeting actually, is one of the authors of some of the latest papers. Paul, are you gonna unmute and- Hello. <laughs> Paul, unmute and <laughs> unmute and give us the, the true word on the Tully. <laughs> so we uh, looked at, I think about 1300 Tully monsters- Oh my God. At the museum. And from that, we found a, a dozen or so, maybe two dozen that had some key characteristics. And we identified it as actually a fish, an agnathan fish which are the jawless fish. Yep. So the closest living relatives would be the, um, the lampreys and the hagfish. Yeah, right. We actually identified it as an early lamprey is what we think it is, but it's, it's a lot different than a, a modern day lamprey. Yeah, they don't have eyes on stalks or. Right, and they don't have a proboscis like that. The mouth <laughs> is completely different, so. Yeah. Uh, and then we've done some, another paper that just came out last year or early this year, um, looking at some of the, um, the organic signals that are still left over from molecules that have degraded over time but are still there, and they match up with the vertebrate uh, fossils. So, mm -hmm. got some extra and a different uh, way of showing that it's also a vertebrate, although there are no bones, just cartilage. Mm. Cool. Yeah. So this was a pretty exciting find. This was a pit 11 find. I, we had just arrived with friends from high school and, um, and, and it, it just was like laying out there like it wanted to be picked up because it was not, I didn't open it. I just was walking. I had just gotten out of the car and I was just five minutes at pit 11 walking along and this fish was lying there on the mound, one of those barren mounds just looking at me. And this is it in black and white, just so you can see how wonderfully detailed this little armored minnow, I guess he's what, like a coelacanth uh, in his construction, but he's only, in it, you know, two inches long. And Rich, you said this was big tooth or? I'm not sure. Andrew, what do you think? A worm or what would you say that is? Looks like the Dodagaster worm, tummy tooth worm. Tummy tooth. That's what I was trying yeah, to Yeah, And I think I think that black dot may be the the um yep. the jaws. If I remember right, that shows up pretty good in person. And, and let me just say that fish that you have is breathtaking in person. Yeah. 
And that's an L and isn't it? That fish? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing the scales if you put a loop on it. it it's amazing the detail, really. The, the, the scales are just absolutely perfect. And that eye and those teeth are really quite, I mean, the teeth are so real. <laughs> It's such a fierce little thing. You like, I just emotionally, I respond to that fish. He's like, he's so determined and he's so fierce. It's like, you know, it's like a minnow on steroids. It's like the whole construction of it is so, and, and you know, it's so interesting that these concretions present themselves. You know, I know it's the mechanics of, the chemical mechanics of what's leaching into the mud around them but it's still, you know, I, I've never, I never lost the magic or miraculousness that it hardened. I mean, what if the mechanics of the chemistry caused it to be softer mud? You know, why did the mechanics make it harder mud? So it's just, it's such a gift in a funny way to the future that, that, that fossils, that concretion fossils fossilized the way they did. Looks like a blade. Oh, yeah, he's got. Yeah, you yeah. can see you can see two eyes. It looks almost like a like a semi dorsal view, or it's twisted or something. You can see two eyes on both on the uh, left yeah. side. A blade. A blade. A blade. <laughs> nice <Huh>. cyclist. <laughs> this American. Yeah. This is one of those Greer, the one of the ones from Greer that was so big and majestic. This guy is, you know, he's not much smaller than he's appearing on your screen. Rich, Rich are you having an emotional response to that? <laughs> I, I couldn't get my, I couldn't get my, <laughs> my mute off. That's Althopter Surly. Yeah. <laughs> I know you were you were scrambling and trembling for your mute button, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is delicious, right? It's very delicious. Gosh. It, it's his favorite plant, so I kind of I kind of softball I, pitched that one to him. <laughs> yeah, and my father sugar coated it for you all those years ago. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. <laughs> And this little horseshoe crab. Was that the one that was the chip out of the real big concretion or is that was, that was a separate one, right? Yeah, I've got, I, no, this is the little chip one. This is the little chip one. I think this is the one that my father had mounted on a board with a couple other things. So maybe the chip one is a different one and I didn't photograph it for the, for the talk. And then this guy, you were wondering, you know, so I put it back up so you could all, is it a seed pod or what, what's going on with this interesting? Not stagmaria? Yeah, root. Yeah, it might be some, it might be some root tissue they called stigmaroides, I think now. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And, and so the little rootlets would come out of those, um, those spots. Right, that makes sense. Maybe that. Oh, nice. And this is a Maison shrimp. You know, the Maison, to find non-plant, to find, you know, fauna at Maison was, was much rarer, so much rarer than finding fauna at Pit 11. And so it was really quite spectacular when you would find something like this at Maison. And then it would have that Maison look, you know, so dramatic. A nice pit 11 shrimp. Was that, was that the one you found open? Uh, yes, this one was open. 
that you said you were walking within the hills and just found it just like that, right? Yes. Yes, if you were lucky at pit 11, you would you could you could find both halves together, but the minute you picked them up, they were in two halves. <clears throat> and of course, at pit 11, if you lost the other half through history, through time and geology, you never could find it. Like the the fish, you know, was only that half. I looked and looked, but I mean, who knows when? Who knows if it was lost when this when it went on the conveyor belt and formed the mound, or whether it had already been lost underground, its other half. But it 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 certainly wasn't there. But sometimes the concretions would open it. Never at Maison would they open on their own. They just didn't. I mean, you you. you but at the, at Pit Eleven, they would sometimes be open like this, but still together. Phil, who's on the call, found a really nice um, scorpion. Mm. We were trying to find the other half for him. Mm. He's still looking. <laughs> Brock found a, a second half to something he'd found like a year later. Mm. In the same area. One of the few no times way. I've heard about that happening. He told me about it. I forget oh. what it was. But yeah. It was a pretty nice fossils, I recall. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's like getting hit by lightning twice in a on a golf course or something. Phil and Valerie, talk, tell them about the story of finding both halves of the shrimp when we were looking for the other half of the uh, scorpion. Well, yeah, we, uh, when we were over there looking for the other half of the scorpion. There was a we were talking about the fact that there had been shrimp found there. And I said, yeah, I had a day there. It wasn't very good. I wasn't finding anything. But then I found an open shrimp by this tree right here. And I pointed to the tree. And then I went away. And the rest of the day went on. And towards the end of the day, Phil went up on a ridge. What were you, 30 yards away? 30 feet. 30 feet away from where I'd found that one. And he finds this open shrimp. He gets it home and he's showing it to me. And I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> it looks really familiar. So I went back to my box and got out the shrimp that I had found to see if it was the same kind, never dreaming it would be the other half, you know, and came wow. back and it was the other half. Yeah. That, was a, that was a year, a year later. Wow. So yeah. we put them in the same box. And I guess we'll just always have to stay married because they have yeah. to be together. They have to be together. But there they are. I, no, I you can see it well, but yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty fun. But that's, that's pretty great. <laughs> so it does. There's probably some useful information in there, but it may only be something about the force applied to the fossils as they went up the conveyor belt from the yeah you know, from the from the, the active uh, uh, vein, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It had just enough power to send them out 30 just, feet or whatever. Right. <laughs> yep. As they dump the bucket. As yeah. they dump the bucket. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, that's a good story. Wow, that's cool. So this is a um, a photo of a photo. That's why it doesn't look like much on the screen. But can anyone do? Does anyone want to call it out? It's what you don't want to find under your kitchen sink. Spy though. It's a big cockroach head. You know. So this was when I was a kid, my best finds. This is a Maison Creek cockroach that I split open at, at some point in middle school. And, um, uh, and, it, and it, we took it to Gene Richardson at the um, Field Museum. You know, the Field Museum uh, members nights. Does this, is this ringing a bell with a lot of people? The members night at the Field Museum. So you could go up on members night to the upper reaches, you know, way up in the attic and see all the different rooms where all the curating was done and all the preparation of all the specimens in the field museum and all the research rooms. And, we're and so having Jean, a, oops, sorry to interrupt, but we're having a virtual member night at the field museum, the 20th and 21st, I think. And as you're talking, I'm working on my uh, presentation for that right oh, now. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, it's a, it was a special, you would save up your best fossils and then you would track down Gene's area and then he would identify them for you. 
And uh, so with his, pipe, with his pipe, always. With, yes, exactly. I definitely had fossils identified by Eugene Richardson there. Yes. My father has a little group of them with a rubber band around the piece of paper that identifies them from those evenings at up at um, at members night. And uh, so I brought the cockroach, you know, with, you know, enormous expectation because I knew it was this really great fossil. And and of course it got oohs and ahs. And then they asked if they could, you know, keep it for the collection. And of course this was a bit traumatic for me, I have to say, but I bravely said, yes, I would donate this to the collection at the Field Museum. So it's up there in a drawer somewhere to this day. And all, you know, all I got from it was this photo. <laughs> but that's cool. That's cool. I'm cool with the photo. Um, you know, and I even forgot what it looked like. And then when we were going through everything, you know, we happened on the photo again. And of course it was out of focus, but whatever. It's still there. So it's the, it, it is a nice, it is a nice piece. It's the, um, you know, the head of the cockroach with the plates and you can see the kind of the, the strong, you know, plates of the, uh, of the, whatever he was, maybe four inch, five inch roach, you know, big, big time roach. But even that's not the sort of the choicest, uh, the choicest I think is my brother's insect, which is coming up. Well, if, if you it, want to send me that photo, I'll look for it in the collection and send you a nice photo at the very oh, least. Oh, thank you. you. <laughs> All right, Paul, I will do that. Yeah. yeah I'll put my, my email in the link or in the chat. Okay, great. So, Rich, you were ooing over this one, right? Yeah, that's Andrew's favorite. That's a flavia. Andrew, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I like that very much. <laughs> I, li I like the weird stuff it is on, you know? <laughs> yeah. The sort of basal plants, you know, the cyclopterus, all those kinds of things, the yeah. oddballs. Yeah. The edges. And this is a beauty. It looks yeah, like it, it's straight out of a salad bar, you know? I know, that's what I was saying. It looks like it's presenting itself, you know? It's just yeah. like, it looks fresh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little oil and vinegar and yeah. balsamic, and you're, you're good, you know, chewy. Very nice. That's a river stone, uh, Peter. Yeah. So this is this is is a is a maison. Mm -hmm. The only possibility would be Greer because you know I don't recollect it literally, but I suspect it's maison. I mean, we don't the Greer stuff. You know, and you would need my father. You know, to you know, so that time has passed when we could have gotten a positive idea on on. But I think, you know, this one's in the collection here. I have to look again, and I think I could tell from the outside. Although I'm not so sure that the Greer and Maison, but it's definitely either Greer or Maison. Yeah, the the lower the uh, the the left hand the left half the lower right corner of it seems to have that kind of a layering that looks very characteristic of the river. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but um, right. yeah, it felt it felt just felt like a river stone to me. But yeah, I think I think it's Maison. Nice shrimp. He's so fluffy. And, and what do people think this is? I think it's a polycate worm for sure, mm -hmm. but it might be, Paul, do, do you know if that's one of the more unusual ones, like a shovel nose worm or something like that? It has an unusual head. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it feels segmented on the right half, like there's some sitae or something there. Right, but it's got that weird kind of pattern on the head area right. there. Right. Flakes. Yeah, I think it's an unusual polycade, I'd say, my guess. Mm -hmm. A little tully and then a nice tully. Folded in half. <laughs> yeah, he, he as he demised, I guess, you know, a wave caught him. It's a yoga tully. Yeah, <laughs> a flexible tully. I like the eye bars. Yeah, it looks like there's eye pigment. Yeah, I, I, right here, right? That yeah. would be yep. Yep. neat. That, that's unusual. You know, they say the eye is, you know, the, the eye 
evolution's greatest achievement, you know, is the eye. Just the fact that we, that we living things on earth managed over billions of years to create a receptor for visible light is really, and then how it works is really insane. And it's so cool to think that even like a Tully monster has this eye going, even if it put it out on a stalk. And then this is, this is my brother Paul's uh, insect and this was a Maison find. And we didn't know, we suspected, but we didn't know the quality of this piece at first because it was hidden in the rock. And then, um, but we showed it to the, to, oh, I wish my brother, I should have asked him a little more details on this one, but there's a researcher who was doing, she was doing um, insects and then she carefully excavated it. So you see the beautiful excavation that was done to reveal the legs and things. Peter, was the researcher's last name Kuklova Peck? Yes, it was. <laughs> Thank you. She, ha she has a signature prepping style. Okay. <laughs> so you identified it. Yeah, it was. She, it was Kuklova Peck. She, she, she said, I would love to, if you guys don't mind, I would love to work on this specimen a little and see what's there. She's a scientist and a sculptor. Yeah. And so that's it. This, uh, this is my father's curiosity cabinet that I have lugged all the way back here to Brooklyn. But, uh, you know, I thought I'd finish with this slide because, you know, my folks and, and their, you, you know, that it's aptly named, their, uh, their curiosity and adventure is spirit is, you know, so it was so important to us growing up and fossils played, you know, such a role in that for us. Uh, you know, not just in Maison and Illinois, but also in other parts of the, the country. But um, so, yeah, I'm going to try to, you know, I got it here in one piece without the glass broken. So I'm going to try to get it, you know, reinstalled with, with some of these fossil specimens in it. And, and uh, well, that's it. Thanks. Peter, that, that, that curio, curio cabinet is, is a monument. That is magnificent. I got yeah, some and, and, and you know, for all for all the emotion and and um, obviously you know, family events, et cetera, that we saw in the photographs throughout the presentation, that that's a beautiful finish right there. Mm -hmm. It's gorgeous. I have one quick question. You mentioned going to grad grad school in art in Alabama. What what school was that? So that's Tuscaloosa. You know, the big mm -hmm. state school, yep. the one with the big football team and all of that. They have a nice graduate uh, art school. But I first went down there for graduate book arts and in letterpress printing and, uh, and artist books. They have a kind of a unique, there's only two or three schools in the country that offer graduate studies in, in letterpress printing, which is a, you know, an old form of printing, but it's updated now with plastic plates and you can do all these artist collaborations and all these things that you do with books and uh, original artist books that use movable type, but also have imagery. And, uh, so I did that for two years and then I got interested in just regular art school and did that for a couple of years there. Uh, you can live in Tuscaloosa, Alabama for you know a couple hundred dollars in rent a month. So I'm sure it's changed a little bit, not much. So I did stay down there for quite a few years, but that's how I ended up there. I was first to do, uh, to do the, so actually I have a whole separate collection of old metal and wood type if you, uh, if you ever want to zoom on that, just let me know. That's magnificent. I just want to mention, I went to graduate school uh, in art here in Chicago. Oh, at the Art Institute? Or... At the Art Institute, yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. And, well, and... Uh, it's pet yep. whether it's still open or it's not. It's just still open for everyone or you can't go in. Are Pitty you speaking Webber. of the museum? No, at the Webber, Webber. at Maytown Creek. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it still open? Yes, service collecting is still allowed. Good. And and to get to the creek now, you you guys, there's an, a point of entry, and then you walk the water, or how does it work? You go to a different farm on the other side. Now we go to the Codex farm, and uh, there's some roads that take us literally to the uh, small path to the shoreline of the creek. Yeah. 
And is that the only stretch of the creek essentially is the one that on one side is Benson and one side is Codex? Is that, or is there another stretch? We never ventured, you know, we didn't find, you know, the shale layer went back down. So we never, we, we, we never went more than about, you know, a quarter of a block in either direction on the Benson side always. Um, further upstream, the homes purchase property so they can excavate fossils out of there. Um, so there are more areas that are available. I think, I, I don't remember who mentioned it. I don't know if it was Dave or Jack Wittry that mentioned that further downstream, there was areas where you could find more um, horseshoe crabs. Hmm. But again, that's all private property now, so we don't really have the access to it. Mm -hmm. An area of intrigue. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so Peter, when, when was the last time you were physically at Pit 11? So the last time I was physically at Pit 11 was that photograph you saw where we were holding the banner was that, that was farewell, and that was 1974. 74. Yeah. Yeah. Be, because I believe the um, the reclaiming or restoration of the landscape, there was a law put into place about mining reclamation right. um, that was around the mid 70s. Yes. Yeah, and that was universal. So I think it was statewide, and and right. you know they began to level the the spoil piles mm -hmm. from shaft mining and planting. They started tree planting and all the root you know binding or the sediment binding plants and things like that yeah right and i think we knew that is why my father had us on this memorial trip but then the following year gene took the group so that it must have taken a few years for that reclamation to really kick in um have you seen any photographs of pit 11 since yeah yeah rich you know rich showed me <laughs> sent me some pictures yeah yeah rich, it's, you it's, it's pictures. breathtaking isn't it yeah <laughs> i mean there, found that it, but then he found that incredible shrimp. So hey, it's still good pickings if you're right, you know, right, right. It's just it's just you, you got to be good. determined. Yeah, yeah. But there's almost no exposed shale. It's virtually none. Yeah. Actually, um, we're kind of at the tail end of what we kind of consider the season there now because the plants are really kind of growing up. So you really yeah. get out there March first, and you know mid May is pretty much the end. I mean, there's been years that we've gone out to mid June, but the ticks really come out, and mm. it's really hard to see the ground. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll be we'll be back next spring again. Keith, you go out to the islands. You can go out there a little bit later in the year. Is that correct? Um, yes, but only a little bit. Uh, as the seasons change, the rushes get really hard to get through in certain places to some of those ridge lines. Um, there's brush this still has to be contended with, but a lot of the walking paths that uh, I have gone on have been uh, in grassy areas. So it's not as bad as it relates to fighting your way through the brush, but even the islands are getting inundated with thickets. Keith, there's been a few times in the fall we've gone out with a boat on this in the south end and kind of climbed up the ridges and and down under the plants on the other side. And, you know, I'm not gonna say the luck was good. You know, we found some jellies. That's about really it. Maybe a shrimp or two here and there, but uh, it's, it's hard to find concretions nowadays. We still get out though. Yeah, yeah, they started to reclaim, I think 75. There was a period of maybe seven to eight years where it was just open and you go and do there. I remember going back in the early eighties once, but I was, my family, we were there from 70 to 72 several times. Then before they actually started to fence it off to because of the construction for the nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. Cause then there was a time where it was not accessible while they were building the plant and then really, really flooding the Braidwood Lake for the, uh, cause they diverted the Kankakee river to flood the, to make that giant Braidwood Lake because they needed that for cooling water for the Braidwood plant. So after the, the mining stopped, uh, it was sort of open. A lot of people built their collections during then. I think Testa once said that he'd go there after, you know, those late seventies periods a lot too. It was just sort of open. 
but it was like starting to get more overgrown and, and they were starting to reclaim areas, but. And then I, I, I think that once the, they started to fence it off, the only way you could get in is on the field museum trips. And I, yeah. I, I know they used to rent a school bus and you could go out there on the trip where it was pretty controlled, mm -hmm. but I know we did that a couple of times, but you, you found very, very little. Less and less. The Dodinas had a bunch of fossils that they had found in the late seventies, at least in a couple of the flats that I purchased. Um, and they were labeled. It was like 78, 79, stuff like that. You know, yeah, that's when there was still open. I mean, again, it was not really completely fenced, I believe. Well, that, that didn't happen until early 80s when the big construction for the power plant. Yeah. Or the, yeah, the, the reactors began. You got some things from my two sons. Yeah, it does. Uh, the wolves. Peter, I've got a question. Um, I'm kind of a rookie at these concretions. I don't know that much about them, but uh, has anybody determined or how long the process took once the creature or plant died and, and sank to the bottom that the whole process took to, to be able to form that concretion? I mean, because a yeah. lot of these things uh, show detail that would be lost if there was any lengthy period like the fish with the scales and stuff I would think would break up if it was laying there very long uh, without starting to already fossilize I guess so to speak. Yeah yeah and I would imagine there's maybe someone listening who can give the definitive here but I think that from what I remember reading you, you um, the decomposition chemistry of the creature being fossilized affected that mud pretty quickly. And there was a process that started almost immediately that changed the local chemistry around the thing being fossilized. And, um, and that went towards, you know, preserving it. I think it had to be anaerobic. The mud had to keep oxygen out. And then, you know, when the mud gets compacted into shale, that's a longer process. So it is a curious balance between something that must have had to happen quite quickly and then a longer, you know, there's like two parts to the, to the problem of preserving something in a concretion. One part would be immediately some things have to happen within, you know, 24 hours that, that influenced the mud and the mud would have to have been anaerobic, I would imagine. And then there had to have been a much longer process that compressed it. Is anyone, does anyone have the skinny on this? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, the encapsulation has to happen quickly because otherwise, right, there would be degradation of the, the quality of the organic tissue. How quickly, there, there, people have done studies and buried these, you know, try to do things, but certainly within, within days, it's being encapsulated into a gel-like sort of state. But yeah, it's anaerobic and there's other EH chemistry kind of things going on. But then to, yeah, to harden in, to lithify, then that happens over a much longer period of time. But if you've got the preservation already happening uh, from the organism into the, because it's, you know, it's a sandy, shaly matrix. The best stuff is obviously the very fine, uh, mm -hmm. silty shales. It, there are some sandstone concretions too. They don't preserve very well, but there are some mm -hmm. in the strata that have sandy, a little more sandy matrix from the delta, but the best stuff was always in. And, and some stuff had more iron uh, pyrite because there was more sulfur in it. And so that's where remember you, you, you notice some concretions are very black uh, compared to mm -hmm. more tan lime and um, just basic siderite around the matrix. But if there's more black, then there's a lot more pyrite. And often those were the ones that would decay quicker in museum cases because uh, the sulfur content with, with, with water, you know, it hydrolyzes the sulfuric acid. Um, basically. So I think, I think anyways, collect their lot knows those black ones often. They could be very beautiful, uh, but some of the black ones were actually oozing sulfur almost. You can almost see edges of sulfur on them. And they weigh different too. The, the more black ones are slightly more dense. I mean, I've done studies where, you know, the statistically it's a little different, the density. And, um, you know, it would be great to try to have, you know, they, the thing about the river is you could see the head wall. Back in the day, for those of us who could get into the actual pit, you know, that's the only other place you could see the head wall. But mm -hmm. us little kid collectors weren't doing that. But Gene 
you know, uh, Charlie Shabika was doing that. I mean, I have his yeah. dissertation. So that's where they're actually trying to find where some of, because, you know, there's different layers that those of us who know the river, different things are different kind of concretions or different layers uh, in the strata there too. Anyway, quickly, oh. several parts, just like Peter said, and uh, still pretty unique. And they're very aesthetically pleasing. That's what I've always liked about them. I mean, mm -hmm. I teach at the art school at Columbia College. Mm -hmm. So just speaking of paper stuff, Peter, we had a pretty big paper, uh, book and paper printing thing, but um, I'm a scientist by mm -hmm. trade. But yes, I yes, Columbia, you had a graduate program. Yep. Right, but I've always appreciated, uh, of course, the aesthetic beauty of the Mazan Creek concretions, not just because they were our, mm -hmm. our thing, but the, the beauty of them just the beautiful symmetry, et cetera. Peter, uh, along those lines kind of, did you find in the shale, say on, uh, on uh, Maison Creek, did you ever find fossils in just the shale itself and not inside a concretion? Or is it fair to say that every fossil has to be in a concretion, I guess? Yeah, so you can find, you know, traces of plants and things like that in the shale. Um, but the shale is pretty breakable, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not an extremely firm shale. It's, so you, what you would find sometimes is, is the impression of a, of a leaf or something in the shale itself. I mean, there's plenty of fossil strata, even in the United States that exist in shale layers that are quite extraordinary. I'll have fish in them and all of that. You know, like the Wyoming Kemmerer shales that are have these gorgeous fish and things. But you know, it sharks. Yeah. I have a shark spine from Pit Four in the black shale. In the black shale, a shark spine. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Well, There's Tom, a that, that wasn't in the uh, in the concretion. It was just in the shale. No, just the shale. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not common by any means. I forget where I acquired it, but. There are some fossils in the, now how that corresponds to some of the other black shales of the sequence like they have over at Oglesby, uh, I'm not sure where you can get uh, really good fossils in that, but you have to work for it. It's not common by any means. That paper by uh, Zangrell from the Field Museum has some gorgeous specimens out of the black shale. Right. Some of the, the black shale time also was out of pit 14 for a very short period of time that was open and you found it, it's exactly what you're talking about. Shark spines, found some sharks. It was 14. Yeah, 14, yeah. Okay, I've, I acquired that thing so many years ago that. I'm almost positive it was 14. There could have been maybe right. some others, but I would say the bulk of the material that came out of black shale would have been pit 14. And it was a okay. very small thing that was only open for a short period of time. And a lot of, if you put that under a microscope, the shell, there's probably all sorts of graptolites, all sorts of things in there that you, you, you don't see. How many pits are there based on Creek? <laughs> Part of the same sequence. 15 or 16 different pits. I, you're right. I've seen a bunch of those papers from uh, some fossils from Pit 14, and and you know back five, ten years ago when Pit uh, Two, Fossil Rock Campgrounds was open, um, we used to find quite a few um, fossil plant impressions in the shale. Mm -hmm. um, they would crumble as they dried. They weren't sort of long lived, right. but uh, but certainly we tried. You know, Keith, you and I and Andrew, we certainly tried bringing some home and. And they generally dried out and just kind of crumbled away. Here's something that's different too. I got this from Braceville. I actually have a fragment of a crinoid mm. from Braceville, mm. which is. Um, are you trying to show it? Uh, it's buried in a drawer here somewhere. Oh, okay. I didn't. Cause... <laughs> I can get it out at some point, but. Uh, well, you didn't it's... have your video. You don't have your video on. So that's what I was no, um, I don't know where it is at the moment. It's, it's in one of these drawers. I'll come across it, but it's probably floated in on the current and it's Bracefields. I suppose it's possible it came from down south where the more open marine conditions existed like down towards Pontiac there are crinoids down there and that's not that far south of Braceville. 
I think it's, it might be different age, but I'm sure there were crinoids around in the open ocean. Um, so the, you do get things in the shale occasionally, but not a lot. Peter, I have a question. Um, you mentioned Pit 11. Obviously, you showed us pictures of your field trips there and Greer School, which I believe is Pit 1. Were you aware at the time of the other Pit numbers or were they accessible to you or open? Yeah, so we, you know, it, I don't know that we ever went to another Pit and this would be something that I would have to, I would have to ask Paul about and if he remembers, you know, we knew there was other Pits. And we knew that people would say, oh, well, that pit has certain things, you know, you can get some ferns in that pit or you can get, you know, that pits had reputations, but the shining star was always pit 11. So we always ventured back to pit 11. I don't, I don't have a memory of going to another pit. I have a vague memory of going to pit four, but I would have to see if I could track that down. I think that there was something about for us you know, the fossils were a big part of it, but it was the fact that it hit 11 was such a grand bad land that it just drew us. But we knew that we knew there were other pits and, and, and um, I mean, we were a little dependent on also, you know, we didn't have GPS, we didn't have Google maps, you know, we knew the route to pit 11. We knew the tricks to get there. <laughs> And so we would be going, you know, you're talking high school into, you know, we're first driving and then in just, there was a stretch there in high school, you'd first get your license and then we could go on our own and we would do the route to pit 11. That's what we knew. Yeah, I did the same thing. I purpose of getting my driver's license wasn't to cruise, it was to go down to pit 11. <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was another area called Dresden Lakes. I'm not sure what pit number that might've been, but yeah. I know that in the 50s probably more people collected there yeah. i know that, that yeah. um, a guy named wilbur raff at the lazardro lapidary school at that point in time used to collect there and had a magnificent collection so wilbur was a member of Oscone back in the day yeah yeah i think he might have been part of the plants through time display too. Does that sound correct? Yeah, I think that's right. And worked with like John Aid and Dick Aid and, and those guys, yeah. Because Scone used to present that at the flower show done at uh, McCormick Place every year. And at the Chicago Land Show in, uh, at when the uh, uh, fairgrounds. Yeah, when that started up, yeah. It was an incredible display. If anybody can remember it, it was just really, really well done. Even I would say even by today's standards. Yeah, we have some pictures of that. Those some of those had even real plants, not just fossil plants, and it, mm -hmm. it kind of spanned not just Carboniferous but other time periods. Isn't that right, John? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was really well done. Quality, the plants that potentially could come out of Dresden Lakes was just spectacular. And even up into the 80s, there, it was still producing quite well. Just not as many hills open, but if you hit the right spot, you could come back with a lot. Yeah, it was probably like the same quality like at, at Greer School. It was, uh... Some Allothopteris has come out of that place that were just, I mean, these are the six plus inch variety yeah. long and three three inches plus wide they were just unbelievable yeah i think i was there once or twice and i didn't get anything on those days didn't get i got concretions just didn't get anything in them yeah chris kodad always told me when i asked him about that he said there were certain places you would go to find them but you'd have to know where those places were like people didn't tell you. Alethopterus is rich. Yeah, and Rich Rock, he got an Alethopterus from there that he had bought a few years ago that he brought to a river trip that was actually breathtaking. I saw Rich's collection, his first collection before he sold it. 
when he had that big double fern that he had, it was a neuropterus was I think a big picopterus on it. I'm not sure where that one came from. It might've come from um, pit six, which was pretty well done by the time I started collecting in the mid seventies. But that was one of the best plants I'd seen in person. He used to put that thing in the Chicagoland show once in a while. Pit six was sort of in the area of Dresden Lakes, right? Isn't that I'm not that sure? Up? I was there once. I was at that place once with Rich, and there wasn't much there when I was there. It pretty much had been. It just wasn't producing anymore. Yeah, and those. I. I mean, even back in the early '70s and things, Dresden Lakes and things that had been mined a long time ago. Yeah, there was still some stuff coming out of there in the '80s, though, because there were a few. Yeah. But you, my, my point was it was just starting to get overgrown and yes to make it more difficult to find things yeah. you had to search for the open areas and hope that there were concretions available at dresden lakes so i came home with a few buckets from there but it was just one of those trips i just didn't get i had trips to the creek like that too you get concretions but nothing much of anything in them it happens yeah hmm Happens now too. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, Peter, it sure brings back memories. All your pictures. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, for me too. And for us, who uh, who I didn't start collecting until 2005. In fact, it was one year after I read an article that came out in the Chicago Reader called "The Vanishing Mother Load." Mm. And not only did it discuss, obviously, the mm you know, paleoecology and the geology of the concretion formation yeah. and the fossils, but also the characters in this community. And, um, and the impression anyway, that I had that so much of it was private property and being overgrown and reclaimed, et cetera. But the following year, I went on a, a field trip to Pit 11 and that was the beginning of this pathology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, 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 so Peter, to watch your presentation is to like kind of, fill in with yeah, imagery right. Right. some of the stories that I've accumulated since 2005, you know, yes. about the golden yeah. age, right? And, yeah. and Pit 11 was extraordinary, right? So many new animal forms were described from there because yeah. it had a marine, a marine uh, community there. Yeah, and that, you know, is why, why we were so drawn to Pit 11 because it was well known that it was the place where you could go for animals. And since we had Maison for the plants, you know, uh, you didn't expect to find an animal at Maison on an, on an average trip. And uh, you were just looking for a beautiful, uh, a beautiful plant. So that's what drew us to Pit 11 was this idea that, you know, there was something uh, about, you know, I, when you were saying there's ticks there now, I was just thinking to myself, you know, how hilarious that is, you know, a tick on your leg, you know, is like a horror and a tick in a concretion is like the greatest find of that year. <laughs> yeah, you can say that again. <laughs> Does anybody have any idea how many um, plants and animals have been identified from the Maison Creek or Pit 11 or any of those that are not found any place else in the world? Or, or any, I mean, are there a lot of specimens that are unique just for this particular area? Yeah, well, certainly the Tully monster was one. Right. And, you know, you don't get to be the Illinois State fossil if you're not pretty special. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think there was a, you know, there was just the sheer volume of, of the different um, organisms made for quite a few holotypes like unique spec you know like perfect versions of a specimen and then there would be variations but it's it's in the literature so it it i'm sure there's a number you know the number of, of insects that came out of yeah. the Maple creek biota i think i don't know if somebody could probably clarify here but i think it's close to 50 percent of the ones from the pennsylvanian right have come wow. out of that area is that some of you guys might know paul 
Uh, well, maybe I should know that, but I don't. <laughs> Uh, but there are a lot of insects and uh, and well, a lot of the, the jellyfish and the worms are and some of the sh shrimp I think are unique to uh, Maison Creek or to Illinois. So I don't have an exact number on that. It's a good question, and I just don't know off the top of my head. You could probably look through Jack Whitry's book and uh, get a rough idea of what that is. Yeah. And pa Paul, do you think some of that might be just collection bias because you've got Pet Eleven is pretty unique. And it could, you know, it could be in other places, but it just weren't preserved. Well, that was the really nice thing about Pit 11 is it's so close to Chicago. You got a lot of people collecting. So you get yeah. a lot of the rare specimens that you might not find elsewhere. So yeah. that's, uh, you know, it's, but it's also one of the, it's, there's not a lot of places where you can get soft bodied animals and, and insects. It's just really rare in a fossil record period. So right. it's a really nice window into the, the Pennsylvania. Right. There's not that many of them around. You're finding it's probably all collection stuff. bias, right? You were finding some of the same stuff in Indiana, uh, south of Terre Haute, around that area. Uh, I even found some spiders uh, in, uh, in that material. I don't know if it's exactly the same, uh, if it's a correlative or, or if it's a different age, but it's very, very similar material. It's it, you have to look at the entire uh, swamp area, the uh, or the uh, the uh, offshore area of the Midwest. It's uh, you know, it's not just Illinois, although you know, we have the lion's share, which is nice, uh, but there are other areas that have uh, similar material. I think it's younger, John. I think okay. that stuff's, I think the Terre Haute stuff's a little younger. Okay. In age. You Not know, much, but some. I mean, it's similar to much of the Carboniferous out east and things like that. Most of the plants and things, I don't know how many are unique here and, and some of the insects probably just because they found here. I think what's truly unique is like what Paul said is the the soft body preservation. Yeah. And the, so the tully monsters and the mm. uh, jellyfish, especially, and I guess some of the worms, that's what's probably, it probably existed over this, the entire Carboniferous, you know, ocean of North America, mm. but it's, the preservation here, especially, so that's what makes our Tully monster. And you could have, if it wasn't that, it probably would have been Essexella, right? If you think about it, that would have been the next choice to have as a unique state fossil, but they probably existed over heck into what's now Europe because everything was co-joined. But well, that's where you have the unique preservation here to preserve that unique part of the fauna. Mm -hmm. And, and the Y and the H uh, animals. Yeah, we have the, yeah all, all those are the big candidates, but the Tully monster is better, I think we all admit. Yes, because it's a nice uh, shellless mollusk. <clears throat> <laughs> well, the name is better. If you would have said, the state fossil of Illinois is the Y. Well, there's a lot of Y problems in Illinois, but I don't think we want that. What, what was that? I, I, I thought I heard something, maybe not. People really like animals that have eyes. Yes, Trilobites, tully monsters. If it has an eye, it's, it's much more caring. Yeah, I, was, I was speaking up for the eyes earlier. Yes, I'm all for the eyes. <laughs> Proboscises are also good. Yeah, that's good too. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's got, yeah, they got it. Tully has it all. Yeah. Like all the name too. I mean, monster. That's the best part. Yeah. I wrote an article for the Field Museum magazine 15 years ago on the history of that thing. You know, obviously we all know Francis, but then calling it a monster, you know, that's, it yeah. sealed it, sealed the deal. As an art person, you know that sometimes you got to get marketing and all these other that's things. Right. It's called the, right. it could have been called the Tully creature and it would have, yeah, or the, the, the Tully animal, pretty yeah. bland. Well, it must have done something with the teeth in that proboscis, right? It must have bit things. So I guess to something smaller than it, it was nasty. Yeah. It's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the slides. I, I do remember that sign with the Wilmington Coal. Yeah, right. <laughs> and specifically with the, the three musketeer yes. thing with the hat. I just, I remember that. Yep. You turn left, you know, go home here. <laughs> yep. If I could yeah, there's something later. very, very Illinois about that whole, you know, a day out there, heading a day out there past the cornfields and finding that sign and the coal and the hills. Yeah, there was something very, you were, 
you know, you were in Chicago and then an hour later you were in Illinois. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks everyone. I really enjoyed really enjoyed it. Very good presentation, very good, Peter. Oh, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. That was really good. Yeah. Hey, very interesting. Thanks. Thank you. It was really fun for me yeah. too. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Yes, really thank fun. you. Thank you very much, Peter. Very good. Thank you, guys. It was fun. And Peter, uh, shout out to shout out to your father. Yes. <laughs> pretty mother. pretty amazing gift uh, he gave uh, you and yeah. your family. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yep. Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks for your time. There we go. Thank you. It was fun. Nice meeting all of you. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. So you guys can, you know, stay in touch and and uh, uh, if you're in Brooklyn, come by. <laughs> And so do you collect in Brooklyn? We collect old printing equipment and metal and wood type. <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell you one, I'll tell you one story, Peter. There is one Maison Creek fossil in the AMNH. Oh, yeah? And it, Just it's, one? It's in the collection. So uh, about a decade <laughs> ago, they came out to the Field Museum for some conference. And uh, yeah. it was a vertebrate. Paul, you know, well, you're, you're not in the vertebrate, but it was... Uh, um, the collections manager of dinosaurs, uh, and uh, at and any rate, they had gotten in touch with me to go out to the river, and mm. so I took them to the river because I sort of had access for a long while to Pete Kodak. Then we went to Pit 11. They really wanted to go to Pit 11. Mm. This was, some of you will remember, that about 12 years ago, Esconi, mm. I don't know who got the money, but got a little money to have a 10-acre area sort of scraped. Mm. Okay, it was right off the road there near Monster Lake. Anyway, mm. it was a 10 acre area scraped and it's like fossil, it had fossil collecting. We went there mm. and uh, just was flat and it was, you know, probably we weren't there the day after, but it sort of picked over. We got like five concretions. All right? mm. Mm. And, but about a month later, I got a picture from my friend and he said, Rhabdoderma, he had a beautiful, Maybe the best I've seen is a rhabdoderma, which is the coelacanth with an egg sac. Oh my goodness! And so he, saw, you know, he put it in the it's in the collections in the vertebrate wow. collections of the AMA. I saw it when I went behind the scenes. So they have it on display, it. or no, no, it's just in the collections. But he yeah, said yeah. It's the only Maison yeah. Creek thing in the American Museum. And since he, I mean, he had the freedom to put it in. He's like the collection manager of right. dinosaurs, but he vertebrate fossils so you open the drawer down the bowels and there it was all right we got to help them out they obviously need more <laughs> well they, they i mean that that wasn't their thing they dumped their plants yeah. and all these other things to yeah, yale yeah. and other stuff but um yes so that was that was that's interesting yeah that's really interesting in fact keith or somebody part of the same story i think when we were at um uh Mizan last year remember we found somebody found a hammer it was me uh, found it, Dave. And that same day, they lost my hammer, yes, at, at the <laughs> river. And so it was lost for a decade until I sort of mentioned this, I think, to Rich last, somebody last year. He goes, oh, it resurfaced. Thing? <laughs> thing? I said, yeah, that's it. So I, I let the guy know, at least I found my hammer again. Yeah, yeah, the river gave up its secrets. There Give you go. Give me the rhabdoderm. I probably <laughs> gave him the concretion, darn it. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> but then we got five concretions. That was it. It was great. Beautiful yeah. box. Yeah, that's really funny. That's good. Well, yeah, museums can be, you know, they can be stubborn about what they want and what they don't want. Well, they only have so much. Best dinosaur collection in the world, so they'll yeah. take that. <laughs> right. There you go. Yeah. Well, in the old days, you know, it was museum's mission to collect everything as much as they can, but... Uh... They're not funded for that, and we don't have room or space, so you really have to, to choose the focus of what your collection is going to be. Right. Right. Well, at least the politics, I mean, private property is an issue, but the politics of, of concretions and all, it's not, it's not fraught, you know, it's not a fraught politics. It's sort of, you know, you, you, it's a happy byproduct of an unhappy thing, coal production, but you know, it's like, 
it 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 in a sense it's sort of a guilt free pleasure, right? <laughs> well, it's become big money, and that's all of us yeah, who know what's going on in the river. So recently, yeah. but yeah, yes, the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you can monetize anything. Still a great place. It's, and it's our place. That's how I like to think of it. Mm -hmm. so, sounds like it's starting to peter out. I'm going to sign out. I'd be thank you very much, Peter. I really you're I was, welcome. Brought back some things when I was really little too. Yeah, I can't. I don't think we have any pictures of that when we went, but we're going back in those days. But I do you have might. the thing signed, and yeah. I can find oh. it. But I, can't <laughs> yes. it. I actually have it on a display somewhere. But yeah. So yeah. Peter, I'm going to say good night. Also, um, I'm getting ready for the second day of our Braceville field. Yeah, trip. you guys are going tomorrow. Early tomorrow yeah. morning. Cool. Yeah. So Keith, That's I'll great. see you at 7 30. Yes. And cool. uh, Peter, thank you again for sharing uh sure, it was you know, fun. with an open heart and 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 family and family dogs and I mean the whole <laughs> thing. It's very personal, very intimate, and, and yeah. a great view into the past. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks for so who wants a 515 wake up call? <laughs> <laughs> I know I gotta get to bed. Yeah. I'll, I'll be sleeping in, Keith. Yes. See you, Valerie. And Bill. Okay, <laughs> Peter, if you uh, send me a photo of that uh, cockroach, I'll be glad to look it up for you and send good. a nice photo I'm and stuff. Totally gonna anything else call. that you might have Thank donated? Okay, that good. Way, yeah. good, good. I will. And when <laughs> things uh, things change and we can have visitors and stuff, if you're ever in Chicago, let me know and I'll give you a tour of the museum. Oh, fantastic. Okay, absolutely. Cool. Thanks. Sure. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, Dave. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Thank you right. very much, Peter. You're welcome. Thanks. It was really Thanks fun. Thanks again, Peter. Thanks. Good night. 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 As the numbers drizzle. <laughs> Marv, good luck tomorrow, guys. I guess Marv will Thanks, Rich. Yeah, we miss you, Rich. Yeah, Marv is gone. I miss you guys too, but uh, you know, I'm I'm here with my daughter. I love that too. That's right. Yeah, That's right, right, right. You got to do what you got to do. It's a season. Yeah, exactly. That's that's nice. It's good stuff, guys. Toodles. I want to take off. It was a good. I I love history of of stuff, and this was uh, this was really really good. It was fun. Yeah. Okay. You recorded, John. Good luck at the uh, at the uh, Yeah. Thanks. Turn the rain off. <laughs> Good night. Good night. You're still recording, I think, Keith. Oh, yes, I am, aren't I?